eighth day of Christmas? Is that what we just f-ing said like literally 45 seconds ago? Eighth day. Yeah, eighth. This year's eighth of the 12 beers of Christmas is Double Think, an imperial stout of the pastry persuasion from Barrel Theory Beer Company. And this one's coming for you sweet too, as it's conditioned on a bunch of Oreo cookies and delicious coconut. Barrel Theory's lead brewer Tyler Oslund and I crack a couple of crowlers to talk about the beer and homebrewers. Get your notepads ready because Tyler has a lot of good take-home tips for brewing pastry stouts at home. The 12 Beers of Christmas is brought to you with ongoing support from BSG Handcraft, Imperial Yeast, and the Patreon supporters of Chop and Brew. Join them at patreon.com slash chop and brew. What up, everybody? It's the eighth beer of Christmas, Double Think Imperial Stout with Oreo cookies and coconut. And one of the brewers, Tyler. What up, buddy? What's up? Well, we just drank a full crowler of double hazy double IPA together, so I think we're... We're good. cozy. We're comfortable. We're good. We're coming down on a nice stout. Yeah. Now we're tucking into this guy. So tell me about. So I would. This is safe to say it's a pastry stout, right? Yeah. And a pastry stout, I would say. I mean, Barrel Theory makes pails. They make pilsners, but it's kind of like hazies, pastry stouts, bomb ass fruited sours. So we've fallen in the middle. Tell me a little bit about this beer specifically, and then kind of just talk about what homebrewers need to know for making something like this at home. Because I think everybody, they're chasing them down at tap rooms, and they know what they are, but I think people probably don't know what they aren't in a weird way. So let's just talk about this beer specifically first. Oreos. What's up with the Oreos, boy? Yeah, it's weird. It's Oreos. Um, obviously, it's, a, you know, like a cookie. <laughs> But when you condition your beer on quite a, like there's about 150 pounds of Oreos in this batch of beer that, that are pre, like pre-crushed <laughs> and we condition the beer on them. And, you know, we've got some coconut in here too. We, we I mean, I, I personally like coconut a lot because it's kind of a natural adjunct and it's, it works very well. And the oils of the coconut help build the body of the stout and the mouthfeel. So the coconut is kind of there to like complement the Oreos. Um, I will say like with most stouts, I think they should be drank on the warmer side of things. Like a super cold pastry stout is gonna, it's not gonna like fully unlock all of the aroma and flavor. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like this is probably like 50, 55 degrees at this point. If it was like fridge temp, I mean, I think I that's poured, I poured mine like an hour and a half ago. Yeah, take it out of the fridge, let it open up, let it breathe. Um, because I feel like when it's super cold, all you get is the coconut and the aroma, but now you like get the little bit of the Oreo. Which is kind of like a doughiness. It's also I don't know what to call it other than doughy, but it's a like it is a baked bread, it's a baked cookie. Yeah, you get a lot of condition. It. I didn't know that. I would have figured it was in the mash. So these actually go into like some kind of secondary. Yeah, step. conditioning on top. That's crazy. Of it. Yeah, it is. What's it, that look like coming out of whatever vessel it's in? <laughs> follow me on Snapchat. You might have been able to see it, but no, uh, it looks crazy. It looks gross because the Oreos, you know, they've been conditioning in there. You know, they, you know, like almost emulsify and disintegrate but you like we did another we did another stout like a one-off stout we were doing for a festival and we used like almost a pound per gallon which is insane but it turned out like you know it turned out great like in terms of like the oreo flavor i really get the coconut which i like yeah the coconut like it's very almond almond joy yeah, and I think some of that almond, like creaminess, comes from the actual filling of the Oreo, you know. And then the the cookie part of the Oreo is definitely like just pumps a bunch of chocolate notes into the beer. Which is Nico, nice. in a couple of beers ago of Christmas, Nico explained he got these like chocolate ice donuts to put into endurance sound he just kind of laced them on the top of the mash 
and then sparge over him. He was like, it basically became like this chocolate, obliterated chocolate icing on top. So now that you're talking about it being in secondary, I imagine it's like this really sludgy, muddy, like coffee out of a French press as you're trying to clean that tank. <laughs> yeah, the coffee out of the French press. I like that analogy. I think that's that's kind of like like how it is. So before we talk about like maybe homebrewers uh, and how they can approach something like this, what are some other pastry stout ingredients that you've tried that think work, whether they were over the top or maybe not over the top? Like what can people do to emulate some of these things so they're not putting a donut or a cookie into a beer? That's a, yeah, that's the age old question. I mean, I think the your your safest bet is like using natural ingredients obviously oreos aren't a natural ingredient but um like coconut and vanilla are probably my, probably my favorite adjuncts because you know they're natural and they're easy to use um and coconut you can go you can do whatever you want with coconut there's a lot of different like variations of coconut you could use raw coconut you could toast the coconut yourself you could toast the coconut yourself in varying degrees you know you could burn some you could lightly toast some and kind of get that like full spectrum of token uh, coconut toast into the beer which is great especially at home at home brewer like you can do that in your oven easily you just buy raw coconut you go to the co-op grab some you know bulk coconut and toast it on your toast it yourself and kind of play with it and add it to your beer you know or you can buy pre-toasted coconut as well. So coconut's my favorite adjunct. Um, oh, is it? Yeah. I, I love it. It always tastes like coconut or depending kind of like you said on how you treat it, might it actually end up tasting like a grain or like another sweetener? I could see it getting burnt and tasting like, God, molasses, like rum soaked molasses. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe like a little acrid. Um, yeah. I think if if it's it's very easy, just spread some coconut out on a cookie sheet, you know, and put it in your oven, maybe on your broiler, whatever you want. Experiment. Coconut's cheap. You, like as soon as you toast your own coconut, you'll get that aroma. You're like, wow. And then you put that into your beer, and you're like, wow. So coconut is. I'm. I don't know. A lot of people don't like coconut Lacroix, but I'm definitely a coconut Lacroix drinker. Oh, yeah. The I, white and tan can, my man. Not through and through for me. So, like now that this this stout is like nearing room temperature, it's really like shining. It's almost still. There's not a lot of carbonation left to it. Mm -mm. I think that's how. I think that's how this beer style is meant to be drank. Um, oh really? Yeah. Like if you have a very cold, very carbonated pastry stout, it's just gonna the carbonation is gonna like aggravate your senses. Um, so like a little bit still and just slightly chilled. I think that's like where these beers, this same style, this really shines. So let me ask you, for the home brewer trying to chase a pastry stout, it sounds like it's pretty, I don't know if specific's the right word, but there are definitely some things I feel like people don't wanna do. Do you have any kind of suggestions to the small scale brewing of this, including how you get that giant starting gravity, sometimes up in like mead strength gravity? Yeah, I mean, it's hard because when I was home brewing, pastry stouts weren't a thing. Um, so I never did a ton of them. I did a lot of big stouts, but more like a Russian imperial stout. So you're looking for that like attenuation and dryness and a little bit of bitterness. Pastry stout is like kind of the opposite. It's like you want a little bit of residual sweetness or a lot of it, I should say. And you want that thick mouthfeel and you don't want to, you don't want to be tasting any hops because that's going to take away from the pastry side of things. So I'd use very minimal hops. I mean, if you have the time, maybe do multiple mashes, you know, no sparge, just straight up collect your first runnings. Maybe do another mash, collect more, more of your first runnings and then just boil it down and concentrate that work. Um, especially as a home brewer, you have a direct, you, most people will have a direct fire system. So you can really kind of caramelize those sugars. And that's what I would do. Don't go too heavily on the roasted malts or the black malts. You don't want that astringency or roastiness because you want it to be 
smooth, you know? You want it to be dark, smooth, and something that can kind of carry those adjuncts, you know? Like something that looks like this, it's like it's yeah. thick. There's not a head on it now because, you know, there's a lot of oils in the coconut, a lot of, a lot of stuff in the Oreos that, you know, probably don't <laughs> help the head retention, but yeah, but that's, you know, that's just the, like the name of the pastry style game. That's really interesting. So low hops, but you got to have hops because they do have to be there. Yeah. Put a little bit of hop, maybe, maybe throw a little bit of hops in the whirlpool. Yeah. A little bit. Oh, really? You might not even bitter a beer like this. Yeah. Okay. I really no, no. Would a home brewer that can't mash or maybe even like boil to the intensity that you're used to, like kind of fake the funk, like would some DME kind of be the answer here, like a couple of pounds? Yeah, you could goose it with some DME, um, whatever DME you want, like light, dark, um, <clears throat> probably lighter because you don't want the added, you know, whatever makes their... Yeah, I always go pills, man, pills, pills yeah. DME. Or you can weed maybe. Um, and then maltodextrin. Um, oh, yeah. A lot of people use maltodextrin in their stouts just to give them a little bit more full mouthfeel. Um, and yeah, just if you're gonna, if you want to homebrew it, like don't be afraid to boil, boil it down. I mean, you can crank your burner up, really get some concentration out of that wort. And then in terms of like yeast, make sure you've, you know, got a good oxygenation level on your wort because you don't like the last thing you want is it to finish you know, super high and you got not as much alcohol and a lot of residual sugar that kind of, you can, you can tell as soon as you drink it when it's too, there's too much residual sugar. What would you say just as a range, not of barrel theory and not of any other people that you know, but like what's a good range for a home brewer to consider uh, an OG and an FG of one of these beers? I would say in, in terms of Plato, I, I'd have to like bust out my calculators for a specific gravity. I've gotten kind of away from that, but I got maybe you. Like, maybe like OG of like 45 feet or sorry, not 45, uh, 35, 40, and even maybe a little bit more than 40. And then depending on what you're looking for, like anywhere from like 12 to 18, 19, so that F, that OG on the lower end would be 1140. Yeah, super high. Yeah. Straight up mead strength. So multiple mashes, long boil, maybe a little DME and and 20. So like, wait, 20? No, I don't think I said 20. I think maybe eight. I said 18. Okay. But I mean, it's still, yeah. Results may vary, you know, especially if on a home brewing scale. I mean, if it starts at 1140 plus and ends as at 1040, I mean, that it sounds crazy, but it's still, that's a very alcoholic beer with a lot of residual sugar. So don't be afraid of a really high final gravity. Yeah, and I mean, as a home brewer, grab some beers that you really like and test them. You know, that's what I know, I, I do that, still do that. like. Oh, this beer is good. And then, like, maybe I'll test the gravity. Maybe I'll throw it in a test tube and try, oh, really? you know, try your hydrometer in it and see what you know, degas the sample and see where it's at. Really, you can on that. That's I've never thought to do that. Well, think about. It. I mean, like, if you're a home brewer trying to replicate a a style, like, huh. grab grab that. You know, if you're willing to sacrifice a little Part bit with half a half a can. Yeah, maybe that's my problem. <laughs> Well, you can still drink it out of the test tube, right? <laughs> Look at you, man. That that's spoken like a true home brewer, man. Yeah, that's where I came. I mean, that's where it kind of came from. So let me ask this one thing, because as at Northern Brewer, when um, Brad, the R and D brewer, and I were talking about a pumpkin pastry stout, he was like, "Well, this is what I think makes a pastry stout," and I was like, "Well, this is what I've been led to believe because I've never brewed one." Is lactose and or vanilla essential to at least the base of a pastry stout? Um, I don't think all, they don't need like they don't need lactose in my opinion. Oh, okay. um, vanilla though, in my opinion, you can't go wrong with vanilla. Like vanilla is okay. 
yeah vanilla is expensive though that's the problem especially especially on a home brewing level like if you want to buy vanilla beans they're very very quality vanilla beans they're very expensive and yeah. you're looking for some like nice thick like like madagascar you know they look like leeches they're just wet when they're you know like kind of shrink wrapped in the packaging like that's what you want you don't want the like little shriveled up dry beans because i mean they work but not as good as some of the other beans that you can get and there's tons of varieties of vanilla bean i mean this is not a christmas beer per se but i can't actually almost imagine another flavor i would rather have because we've been our advent calendar literally has chocolate in it so every day we're like oh like a very different kind of chocolate and this was like a chocolate covered coconut yeah i'd recommend using you know chocolate malts pale chocolate malts to get that color maybe some you know craft three the bitter malt you know back off on the roast the roasted barley and the black malt I feel like it's a little too astringent um and yeah just a ton of sugar and then a solid yeast starter the roasted barley almost seems like you have to have it in a beer that this color but that's at this point that's not the case because of so many other malts yeah and 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 then it depends on like what you choose for your adjuncts too if you if you're using a, a bunch of sweet adjuncts like a bunch of Oreos, for example, you might want a little bit of roast just to kind of counteract that sweetness. I mean, it's very, it's a very sweet beer, but it's also drinkable. You know, I wouldn't say I could drink more than two ounces of it. Like some pastry styles I've had, like it's like, oh, okay, one ounce is cool with me. And it's, you know, it tastes great, but my body is telling me no. <laughs> yeah, they're good beers to share for sure. And I did, and you did not. <laughs> yeah, I think it was got some, but I still got a, I still got like a half a crowd. Hey, it's Sunday fun day. All right, Tyler, I appreciate you shouting out to the home brewers in the house, letting us know a little bit behind the double think, the double think tank. Till the next time, brother. Chop for chop. Brew for brew. Whoa, whoa.